this is Bloomberg. Take my, a lot of you have taken my class, so you know the, basically the drill. Some of you have it. You're be scared. But don't worry about it. I don't bite. You know, I don't draw blood. Um, we definitely need you to, if you're a junior, you need to, uh, you need to work with Mary, me and Mary Beth to get uh, you an internship. The window is open right now, and it's closing very quickly for the top companies for internships for next summer. If you miss the window, you're going to be working someplace. I don't know. But um, we can probably help you find a really good internship um, for next summer if you're working with us right now. And you got to get a resume. Here's some examples of some really good resumes that my students put together. You got to have a resume for this class. Okay? You know, we're in my class. You have to resubmit the resume three times during the semester. Get it done. Go work with Mary Beth. Um, you're going to need it for the internships and the jobs. Okay? If you're a senior and you don't have a job lined up, you need to work with us so you can get a job. Worst thing that could happen to you is you end up in your senior year in the spring, you're partying, you're feeling good, the sun's out, you're in your shorts, you got a tan, and you go, oops, I forgot to get a job. Okay? That's the worst situation because you're probably going to be placed in some kind of recruiting firm or headhunting firm, and you won't get placed in a finance position on a financial career track. Okay? So you got to be thinking a little bit further out for that stuff. I'm probably going to jump around on some stuff. Here's my tome um, syllabus. If you took my 123, it basically looks the same, but I rewrote portions of it to be focused mainly on the investments. Okay, so your 123, unless you took it with me, uh, the first uh, three weeks of the class is going to be basically up to the quiz um, in my 123 class. I know a lot of you probably don't remember doing a lot of that stuff, so a lot of this is reinforced. And what you're going to find out is in finance, <clears throat> you know, you're going to go, oh, it's net present value and PV and IRR and discounted cash flows and perpetuity, Gordon growth, multiple approach, DCF. Um, you forget a lot of that stuff. But when you start moving into your career, you think about it all the time. And you reinforce those uh, fundamentals over and over again, just as like, just like if you were a, a you know, professional sports person or a sports person. Here, you're constantly going through the models in your head to refine them, memorize them, so that they, uh, they're innate to you. So that if anybody asks you any questions, you can respond to them intelligently because you understand not only the, the basic models, but you understand the vernacular and finance. Okay. Um, so we'll go through the, um, the midterm in a second as I hand out everything. Um, you're going to do a statistical pretest for those who have already taken my class before. Unless you threw the pretest out or your dog or cat ate it, which has happened before, or it's underneath your bed somewhere collecting dust, you may want to pull it out again and then work with the other students that haven't taken the class um, to help them answer some questions for them so they can move through the material very quickly. This should be a review uh, of your statistics class. Um, and the fundamentals and a lot of the information is already in the book. And is in your 123 book if you took me with Carino, which should be there. And then there's resources on the website uh, that I can show you that'll fast track a lot of the uh, stuff. But I would probably go back and rework these things. Uh, for those who did take the course before, rework uh, the practice exam because it's just reinforcement that ingrains variance and standard deviation and correlation and covariance and all that, uh, those important things. Uh, also, you know, I put in for you, since you're an advanced class, I put in the quiz, which is the first third of the class. So we cover basically the quiz, which is really the pretest here, which we go over the first month of my, um, of my 123 class. So others in the class will help you. I will go through those again because I talk about yield curves and yield curve inversions. Is the yield curve inverted right now? Yes, it is. I mean, if you take the uh, the two year and you subtract the uh, 
The 10 year, it's now negative. So the differential between the two and the 10 is negative. The first time since 2007. What happened in 2008? What happened in 2008? You got it. Was it a severe recession in 2009 and yeah, yeah. eight? Yeah, the mother of all recessions, the mother of all uh, collapses in the stock market. It, it, my class isn't appealing to some people and you find this too much, um, you can just get up and leave. You know, I, I won't take it personal, okay, if this isn't gonna work for you, okay? I won't take it, I won't take it personal. So the statistical pretest is really important uh, because it's basically the statistical fund foundation that you're gonna need for finance. And you'll see this stuff over and over again. And if I say variance and standard deviation, it's the first thing that comes to your head. What comes into your mind when you hear variance and standard deviation? If I'm looking at st stock returns, Uh, we're going to go over, you know, different types of distributions. I'll let you do that because different data sets that you're going to be looking at are help, will have different distributions and sometimes you may not have enough data. So you're going to have to apply simulation using Monte Carlo simulation, maybe in MATLAB or something like that. So that's kind of grad school finance. Um, but to understand different types of distribution is really important if you ever have to run simulations, which you might. Um, and if you, anybody goes on to grad school, you'll definitely be using Monte Carlo simulation, okay? Means, median, modes, uh, different types of uh, distributions, skewness, kurtosis, lipidocurtic. Show me the uh, diagrams and the definitions for histograms, stem, leaf, box, plots, and then show me the equations and the definitions for the variance, standard deviation, confidence intervals. What are the three confidence levels that we use when we're testing statistical significance for independent uh, variables, ability to predict the dependent variable? What are the confidence levels? Okay. Uh, what's the T statistic? What's the F statistic? And by the time you work through these, you know. <coughs> Coefficient of variation, risk adjusted ratio, return, shock ratio, Jensen, trainer ratios, those are all portfolio uh, analytics that you would use if you're analyzing multiple portfolios and trying to decide which one you're going to uh, pick. Uh, covariance, we're going to use that um, in our optimization. We're going to do a passive static portfolio, and then we're going to do a active uh, portfolio using the quadratic optimization, which was invented by Harry Markowitz in 1957. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize, and the computers at that time, technology, couldn't even run the factorial algorithms uh, that he had designed mathematically until the early 80s. And when they did figure that stuff out, they launched the mutual fund industry, which is now morphed into, into the exchange traded fund industry which is uh, multi-trillions of dollars of assets under management. Since you're going to BlackRock, you'll understand all that stuff, if you don't already. Uh, on page seven, um, I ask you for the portfolio standard deviation, not the standard deviation. It's the portfolio standard deviation uh, with the correlation coefficient on the end of it, and the other one with the covariance on the end of it. Okay. And you may want to write this note down. If the co covariance or the correlation goes up, when the portfolio standard deviation goes up, the correlation of covariance goes down, the portfolio standard deviation goes up. Okay. I know you guys, I, I, that's why I record my lectures, because I speak really fast. And you guys don't take notes. Okay. For re some reason, your generation doesn't take notes. Because you have a photographic memory and you remember everything you hear and everything you see. So you don't need to take notes, right? Uh, all right. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, building regression models. Um, how many variables um, should be, or what's the maximum number of variables that should be in a regression model? Max. Five. Yeah, no more than five. And, and even with five, when you have more, what's the problem that you run into? Multicollinearity. Multicollinearity. And if you get multicollinearity, how do you decide which one to, what, if you have two variables that are highly correlated to each other, but also correlated to the dependent variable, how do you decide which one to keep and which one to throw out? This is all review. Right? Which one do you keep? Which one do you throw out? What do you use as the decision rule? The one that's been cited the most in the theory. Okay. And the one chart. Okay. Uh, Cross-sectional regression, time series regression. How do you pick the dependent variable? Well, that, you're going to know that from your literature, you know, from your body of knowledge that you're learning in the finance discipline you'll know to measure, such as return on equity is the number one factor you probably want to be able to forecast if you're trying to forecast stock prices. Um, you can use a panel 
study using cross section, which is one time period um, across multiple <coughs> companies, or you can use one company across multiple time periods using time series regression. Okay. Uh, Professor Susan, why are you teaching us this stuff? I mean, you know, this is all, I thought this was a finance class. Well, finance is basically based on solid you know, statistical applications and now big data and cloud computing applications. Uh, we're now being forced into being able to uh, basically test a lot of the theories and apply them um, because we have massive amounts of data and we have a very, uh, uh, the, the ability to compute that massive amount of data now to actually process it is a million fold what it was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So things have totally revolutionized uh, the field of finance. Uh, systematic and unsystematic risk, you can uh, diversify away on systematic risk, but you can't diversify away systematic risk. Um, go back, give me, show me a, a balance sheet, assets and liabilities, show me a corporate income statement, show me a cash flow statement. And then the key metrics, ROE, ROA, debt to equity, debt to total market cap, PE ratio, earnings per share, weighted average cost of capital, which is the discount rate when you make any investment decisions using the discounted cash flow method. Uh, capital asset pricing models can determine the cost of the equity or the expected return on the equity and the arbitrage pricing theory is basically, basically a cross-sectional regression model to forecast returns on stock using economic factors. So that was basically a brief. And then show me the perpetuity model where the cash flow is uh, assumed to be level in the perpetuity, show me more growth, the multiple approach, and this kind of cash flow show me theoretically and show me and then I'll get into the, uh, the quiz stuff in a minute. Um, you're also going to be producing five memos in the class. You're going to be analyzing stocks, oil, gold, bonds, uh, and uh, foreign currency. Uh, where's the Dow Jones today? Uh, okay, you, gotta, you have computers in front of you, okay? So you've got to use the computers. Uh, your generation is the most powerful generation on Earth because you have access to technology instantaneously to help make decisions. So you need to engage your fingers on your computer and go to Yahoo Finance or big stock, StockCharts.com, BigCharts.com, um, Economist, Financial Times, a new, a Wall Street Journal, whatever source, and get, find the information. If you go to Yahoo Finance and you go to, you go, go to Yahoo, Go to finance, click on it. There's a dashboard at the top that basically has all the major asset classes um, that we are going to write memos on and we're going to study for the rest of the semester. And when you come into class, I'm going to ask you, what did the Dow do today? Where did it settle? Uh, is it up or down? It's and why? 213. It's what? It's up 213. 213. So there was probably positive news out there, either a resolution <coughs> on the trade war or interest rates went down or earnings expectations were those are the main uh, causes of uh, stocks to go up. Um, if the stocks go up or down 250 points, is that a big move? Or is that white noise? Is that a big move? Big move? Or relatively big move? Or nothing at all? Just noise. Relatively big move. What if uh, the stock market goes up or down 500 points? That's a big move. What if uh, the stock market drops 1,000 points like it did when the yield curve inverted? about uh, three, four weeks ago. Is that a big move? Yeah. But that market actually went up in time. Um, where's oil right now? Where's oil trading per barrel? Uh, 56.25. Is it up or down? Uh, 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 what would give you two factors that would drive oil prices up? This is all review for a lot of years. What would cause oil prices to go up? Supply or demand? Did supply increase or did it uh, decrease? Decrease. Uh, did demand increase or decrease? Okay. So basically, now find the factors uh, that would either drive the supply, uh, cause the supply curve to shift back, or cause the demand curve to shift up. Would global demand have a, a, an impact on uh, prices of oil? China started to recover, and India, India started to recover when we revised our GDP growth rates up. Would that in increase demand for oil? GDP was increasing, gross domestic product, mm -hmm. government, investment, consumption, net exports. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about if OPEC cuts back 
uh, on production to try to drive prices of oil up, uh, to basically generate more uh, sovereign wealth, uh, to be able to pay uh, for all of the uh, social welfare programs that they provide their uh, populations. Would they do that? Yeah. Okay, so where is uh, gold per ounce? Do we care about gold? Where is it? Oh, sorry. 1563. 1563, they're forecasting gold to go to 1600, and maybe even higher. Uh, give me two reasons that would cause gold prices to go up. Higher expected inflation. Yeah, higher inflation. Risk. Exactly. And geopolitical risk. Exactly. Are you writing this stuff down? Are you writing this stuff down? You should be writing all this stuff down. You're not going to remember anything. Are you guys recording this uh, lecture? I'm videotaping it. So are you writing notes? Are you uh, videotaping it? Don't you do that in your other classes? <laughs> you just check out, check out your Facebook. Uh, just do something more productive and listen to the economics. Um, here's some, uh, you're going to be using calculators in this class. So what I did was I sat down for like three hours, four hours, and basically wrote up some notes you know, on calculator. Procedures using the HP 12C, 2B, the 10B, TI. Um, so you may want to use these different methods. Uh, do you guys all have plenty of calculators? Plenty of calculators? Yeah, you should just put it for Because you're going to probably need it. Uh, the 10B, uh, Texas Instrument 10B, this one right here, this one is uh, totally cheap. It's a financial calculator. That's 40 bucks. Okay, so it's really easy. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, where's the 10-year treasury yield? Do we care where that is, where that's trading? The 10-year treasury yield? Yes. Do we care? Uh, using the Fisher equation, what are the two factors that would drive all of interest rates up? Can you look at the Fisher equation using the Nestopedia? I'm just getting you to, to train you because you're going to be sitting in these meetings. And people are going to be asking you questions, and if you're basically looking up or staring at your phone, you're, they're, you, they're going to ask you to leave. Okay. Um, now you have tablets, cell phones, uh, laptops, computers in front of you. You can look at the information instantaneously. Give me and everybody else in the meeting the data so that we can move forward on designing the solution. Okay. And I'm going to teach you how to train your brain to invent financial product. Okay. Remember the marketing class that you took? Basically, we're applying the same concepts in marketing. We're not designing an iPhone. We're designing derivative contracts and exotics and portfolio strategies, and indexes, and ETFs, or mutual funds, or you know, risk management strategies, or something like this. Okay, that's our job. Okay. Anybody ever hear of FinTech? 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 <coughs> FinTech. Have you heard of FinTech? Now, it's the conversion of technology and finance. Okay. Now, there are companies that are basically uh, startup companies. They're uh, bootstrapping. The founders are throwing in some money. They're looking for angel investors. They basically launch a fintech company, either in payments or you know, portfolio management or trading systems. They're up and running. And before you know it, uh, these guys are raising 25 million bucks. And they're going to $2.5 billion. Um, you know, within maybe two, three years. So now technology is permeated finance. Okay. And they want us to be uh, innovators. Okay. Not just drones that basically sit in classrooms, you know, studying theory, you know, in a esoteric, myopic way. They want us to be innovators. Okay. To be able to apply technology and, and apply the, uh, uh, the theories that you've learned, stress test them, and actually build product in process. Uh, I'm just going to keep handing stuff out. Um, here's your exam. Okay, this is the take home quiz. Okay, I wrote this up too. It basically follows the book. This is the book, uh, Bodie King Marcus. It's basically the Bible of investments. It's basically used as the uh, textbook for the Chartered Financial Analyst certification for years and years and years until the uh, CFA Institute uh, figured out that instead of 
you know, pushing and selling other books by other publishers and other authors that they could basically take the publication rights, design their own content, and push that and make you buy it uh, when you go for your chartered financial analyst certification. So, um, based on your uh, syllabus, when is the take home quiz? Your syllabus is a friend. It's a lot of work. Okay, this, is a, this is a lot of work. So I'm not asking you to do it in a week or two. So you have over a month. Can you do it in over a month? What happens is a lot of people in my class is what they'll do is they won't um, apply efficient time management skills and wait to the very end. And then when they try to attempt uh, the course load, the workload in the class, they get totally slammed. And then they blame it on me. Okay. Horrible professor, gives too much work, uh, doesn't go through things enough, makes us study on our own, you know, makes us learn the finance by ourselves. Um, I can teach you finance, but you have to learn, learn how to learn finance. Okay? Because they're going to ask you questions. Can you build a commercial real estate index to be used to trade property derivatives off of? What's your answer? Not yet. Um, maybe you, yeah. but everybody else is yes. Okay. Because can you figure it out? Yeah. Could you figure out how to do it? Yeah, Google. Yeah, you could probably Google it. You could probably, could I talk to other people that maybe have done it before in the past? Sure. Maybe I assemble a team. Experts uh, beyond my comprehension and my capabilities, and basically put together the team, and I'm the product pro and uh, project or the program manager, and I basically manage the process. That's the that's the easiest way to do it, and the funnest way to do it. Um, so the quiz, you have plenty of time. You can work together in teams. Uh, I would uh, I would form as soon as possible teams of three. So that's going to be your high performance teams. And then you can uh, work in, uh, in sub teams where you're basically working with other team members to basically accelerate the process and basically reduce the workload by uh, being able to produce more, more efficiently because you're using human capital and labor as a way to uh, accelerate the production process. And that's how, I, that's how my classes are, are geared is not towards intermittent assessments at, at random period of times throughout the semester. Oh, we're going to have an exam on X date. Um, I need you to study X, Y, and Z. You're going to come in on that day and just take the exam, and I'm going to basically base a third of the gra grade based on that one exam in some kind of normal bell curve distribution. And if you don't do well, you know, I give you an F or a D. And if you do okay, I give you a C. And if you do really well, I give you a B and an A. Does that sound ludicrous? They don't do that in the real world. Uh, what we do is we basically give you assignments and projects to work on in teams. And you basically work on the production. And then I, I along with the team members, review the product, give you critical input. Uh, you go back and revise it. You raise the level of quality of the product. And then you submit it back to us to be signed off on. Once it's signed off on, then it's ready to be presented to the investment committee, the board of directors, and senior level managers. Okay? And then you just do that over and over again. Okay? There's no multiple choice exams at Google or Facebook or BlackRock. You know, we don't do that stuff there. We basically give you projects to work on, and then you produce. Okay? And then we work with you. Um, right? Anybody like it? Any questions? So I'm an applied financial economist. Uh, I work uh, in the real world, and I work in academia. Um, my academic experience, anybody else, is to basically train you, not educate you, train you, okay, for uh, high-level corporate positions, okay, to give you a solid foundation of the expectations um, that you will be confronting uh, as you make that transition from the academy into the real, real world. Now, some of my students, particularly in 123, are still, you know, they're still kind of holding on to their post-adolescence. You know, they kind of like the country club lifestyle. They're not ready, you know, to really launch into careers and into adulthood. 
so they kind of give me a hard time. But, um, but those who embrace um, their careers and embrace adulthood and the opportunities that will be presented to you on a career path and the wealth and power that you will be given if you stay on track and if you make that transition smoothly and on a very solid trajectory, um, you will blow everybody away in your peer group. Okay? And you'll go work with some really great people. Okay? Um, you're going to do, uh, do, do, also do movie reviews. That's what we do uh, with the deliverables. We do deliverables in this class. So they're packages. Uh, I think I had an example. This is a good example. These are good examples of the final product. This is an assemblage of the projects that eventually are rolled up into a final report. This is a portfolio trading system. Okay, We do fundamental securities analysis. So thank you very much, Dakota Armour, who programmed it for you uh, during the first semester I did this class. Okay, We do moving average crossover systems, which is a technical Securities analysis tool that I designed myself, and I had one of my students program it. Thank you very much. Okay. And then we do, uh, I basically programmed a static uh, portfolio model that you're going to be using. I'll go over it on Thursday. You're going to populate the data. I'll show you how to do some of the calculations. Boom, you have a portfolio there. So we're going to be building different types of products. And then you roll it up into one of these reports at the end of the semester. But you present them individually during the semester as though you're presenting them to a board of directors or an investment committee to basically get approval to launch the product okay, or the portfolio. Because isn't that what it's all about? Assets under management. I raise a billion dollar fund and I charge one, you know, one point, one point in asset management fees. How much money are we bringing in? One billion times one percent is ten million. Can you live off that? Even if I give half of it away, it's still five million, and I have four analysts to myself. Everybody else, everybody gets a million each. Okay, maybe I get two when we split this, the rest of it. Okay, can you live off four hundred thousand dollars a year? Can you? Yeah, you yeah, can. Okay. Uh, that's the kind of money that we're talking about uh, in finance. If you put yourself in the of the capital flows. Okay. So here are some examples. Oh, I forgot the uh, ten-year Treasury note. Where's it yielding? And what are the two factors that drive nominal interest rates up and down using the Fisher equation? I'm just giving you just a crash course. This is the real interest rate and uh, inflation. Inflation expectations. expectations, exactly. That's right. So uh, real rates don't move very much in the short run. So the majority of movements in uh, the in the ten-year Treasury yield is driven by. Run. That's okay. Oh, it's out. Uh, real rates, real the real interest rate plus inflation expectations drive nominal interest rates up and down. Real rates don't move that much, okay, in the short run. So the majority of movements in 10-year Treasury yields or in interest rates come from where? Inflation expectations. Inflation expectations, got it. Okay. Um, so where's the 10-year Treasury yielding today? Which is the benchmark interest rate? Do you care about the 10-year Treasury? Yes. Yeah, because your student loan your car loan, your personal loans, your mortgage interest rates are all priced off of the 10-year uh, treasury. And the 10-year treasury, is it, is that a risky bond or a risk-free bond? Risk -free. It's risk-free. Okay. So it's basically the base rate. And then you start tacking on risk premiums or credit default risk premiums or whatever measures that you're using to basically get to some interest rate to compensate you uh, for all the risk that you're taking. So where's the 10-year treasury yield? 1.456, 1, 1. is that high or low? That is really low. That's historical. Actually, the 10, 20, and 30 has actually hit historic lows within the last two months. Are we in a recession? No. And we're still at historical lows. Where's the unemployment rate today? Yeah, it's like 4.3. Uh, where did GDP come out um, at uh, on Monday? It was, uh, it was announced, uh, the revision, for the second quarter. 2019 on the annual basis. Can you look that stuff up? Can you type that stuff up? Can you go on the computer and look up uh, what the Commerce Department re reported for GDP 
annualized for the second quarter compared to the first quarter. Did you release pre pre one one? That might have been the original that they revised. Is uh, what? With the revised second quarter. Uh, two percent. Got it. Two percent. Okay. And where was it in the first quarter? Three point one. Three point one. Got it. So is it uh, has it increased or decreased? It's falling. What does that tell you about inflation expectations? Well, Have they gone up or down? Okay. When the economy is slowing. When the economy is slowing, is there more or less supply in the market? Or you're getting three of them. Oh, okay. Less. Hold on. It, that's right. Hold on. Let's do it again. Okay. If GDP is slowing, is there more or less supply of commodities in the market? No. Are you consuming or are you investing more when GDP falls? Is there more or less supply? More supply. Right? If demand is falling, is there more supply? Yeah. If there's more supply, do prices start to fall? Yes. And that would cause inflation expectations to go down. And if inflation expectations are going down, what happens to nominal interest rates? They go. Inflation expectations go down, nominal interest rates go up. Uh, okay. Really? How does that work? They go down. I'm going to trick you to see if you actually know. To watch me, I will t totally trick you. Why? I will totally trick you. If, infl if, if inflation expectations go down and interest rates go down, uh, bond prices go down, don't they? Okay. Yeah. No, I have no idea. <laughs> why, why is it, why is hey, here, let's do that again. If inflation expectations are going to go, go down, do, do interest rates go down? Yes. yes. And if interest rates go down, do bond prices go down? No. They go up. You have to memorize this. So the 10 year treasury is at basically an all time low. Okay. And we're not in a recession. Although GDP is at 2%. And it was at 3%. Uh, what's the definition of a recession? Two straight quarters of negative growth. Uh, two straight quarters of negative GDP. Uh, when was the last time we had negative GDP? Sorry? When was the last time we experienced two quarters of negative gross domestic product? 2007. Yeah, like 2007, 8, you know, in there. Exactly. Um, so where is the, did the 10-year Treasury yield go up or down? Down. down it went down. Okay. So bond prices then went uh, up and inflation expectations went it's just rules. If uh, ten-year Treasury yields went down, what did inf inflation expectations do? If uh, if ten-year Treasury yields went down, what happened to inflation expectations? They went down. Okay. If interest rates went up, inflation expectations went. If the economy was forecast to grow at 3%, but was a revised down to 2%, what do you think inflation expectations did? Went down. Went down. And if inflation expectations went down, what happened to interest rates? They went down. And what happened to bond prices? Up. Get it? That's the game. Okay? Up, down, up, down, up, down. Okay. It's just a game. Finance is a game. Accounting is a game. You're learning basically the uh, language and the nomenclature and the models so that you can communicate with people when you get out in the real world at very high level. When you get into the senior level, uh, level in these meetings, everybody understands the economic theory, everybody understands the change to stay focused. The ADD kicks in. You put some uh, copy in with the little ADD and you can't get them to slow down. Um, you're going to be talking at very high levels, so we're going to assume that you understand basically everything that you've learned, uh, particularly within the last two years of your uh, core. And if you did really good grades, they will, gi they will give you the last two years of your business degree. They will count it as work experience. So, Professor Sousa, I don't have any work experience. I didn't do any internships. I don't have any work experience. Really, what was your GPA in 3.6? Excellent. What was your GPA in your in your concentration, in your major, uh, 3.6, 3.8, great. Just report back to them, because they'll know that you know. Okay. 
You're going to do three. You're going to watch three movies. You're going to watch, and, and some of you have already seen it. You can see the inside job. You're going to see the big short and margin call. Okay? You're going to do it together. You're going to fill out these sheets. You're going to hand one of these sheets in. No. But you already have the three. Okay, so the inside job is the first one that you're going to want to watch because it's an award-winning documentary on the origins of the financial crisis. You don't really get into the long-term implications and ramifications. They really don't get into the long-term implications and ramifications of the financial crisis, but the financial crisis was basically analogous to the world war, where we basically spent you know, trillions and trillions of dollars to bail out you know, the capitalist system, particularly the banking industry, which basically ran the economy into the ground by manufacturing fictitious and outright criminal activity in the mortgage market and in the investment banking market. And we bailed them all out. And it cost us uh, $5.3 trillion. The Fed just printed $5.3 trillion out of thin air. Actually, it was a, it's up to about 35 or $40 trillion based on the other central banks on a global basis. They just printed money out of the world, out of nowhere. And then what they did was they basically bought sovereign bonds to basically finance fiscal deficits that basically were racked up um, by mainly the emerging markets, but also the industrialized markets. So unfortunately, I hate to pop your bubble, um, but if we do fall into another recession, we're not gonna have monetary policy tools or fiscal policy tools to basically fight the, the next recession or financial crisis, because we've already shot our bullets in both guns, both fiscal and monetary. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Okay. Um, anybody interested in getting their security licenses? Yeah. So I cut a deal with Axel Advisors um, to basically uh, allow you for $116 plus tax to take the first level of the, the, the Series 7. The Series 7 was split to the registered representative license. Um, it was split in two, um, and basically the uh, FINRA, which is the uh, organization uh, that governs all the licensing in the securities industry, um, basically said we'll split the Series 7 and allow you or anybody else who wants to to take the first half of the Series 7 without a, spo a broker dealer sponsor. Woohoo! That's totally awesome because now you can basically take this exam put it on your resume and when somebody asks you do you have the securities license, you say, yeah, or you took the SIE. And I'm looking for a sponsor to take the second half of the Series 7. Right? And they'll hire you because the, if you look at the content of the SIE, it's basically a lot of the trading stuff which is in your investments book. And it's basically everything that you've learned in your investments book and in your finance classes and in your, uh, your economics. So it should be relatively easy. It's gonna take about a month for you to study for it. Um, if you do register, check and make sure this registration link is still active. If it's not, I'll call them and tell them to reactivate it. Um, and, if you're, and what you should do is uh, put together a study group, okay, and then pound it out. And when you're ready, go take the exam and get it done. So you can take it without a sponsorship. Are you, are you gonna be doing a SIE? Uh, I don't know, I don't know, I might. I don't know, I'm really busy with this most of I got like two jobs right now. Um, so once you get your, uh, once you do the SIE, you can go investment banking, equity research, fixed income, wealth management, wherever you want to go. Then you'll get in and you'll take the uh, second half of the Series 7, then you'll get your Series 7, which is your registered representative license. Once you get the Series 7, you can sell stocks, bonds, option contracts. It gives you basically the license to sell um, registered securities, okay? Um, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna get the uh, Series 66 or the 63 or the 65. I recommend that you get the 66, which is your, reg uh, your registered investment advisor uh, license. Now when you get the 66, what you can do is you can do equity research and sell that research if you want to, or any research, um, fixed income, you know, whatever it is you want. Um, with the uh, 66 as a registered investment advisor, I can basically come up with uh, the same stuff that we're doing in this class that I'm going to teach you, and then basically go out and become your own registered investment advisor. 
and then basically get assets under management based on your portfolio strategies and your trading techniques and basically get assets under management and then charge your clients fees to do that. And then I highly recommend, anybody else need, can I not give these? Everybody get one? Um, and then I highly recommend that you get the, the California State Life Only Insurance License. Okay? Life Only Insurance. And you can do that right now. And if you get the SIE and you get the insurance license now or the next two semesters, it basically will guarantee that you get a job. And you might as well go work for JP Morgan or maybe Goldman Sachs if you know somebody. Um, or you can work for Wells Fargo Advisors or B of A or you know, wherever you want to go. Or you can go work for, I work for New York Life, you can go work for Northwestern or AXA or some of these other companies that not only sell securities and investment management, but they also sell insurance products and variable annuities and annuity products. So once you get the insurance license with your continuing education in long-term care, and in annuities, you can sell anything. You can put together any solution, for any client, and make money. Okay? And then it's just a matter of going out and prospecting and finding clients um, that will trust you and your company not to steal their money or lose their money, okay? which is a tough, tough sell, especially when you're 20-something years old. When I was 50-something, they still didn't want to sell to me. Okay? Even with the doctorate degrees and master's degrees, all that stuff they didn't care, they just didn't trust me. Because okay. finance has a bad connotation um, based on years and years of corruption and mismanagement, thievery, and stuff like that. But if you can overcome those objections by having a good company with a good brand, that's awesome. Uh, if you can um, have good, sell a good product that actually performs over the long run, that's awesome. If the company has Sheet, uh, that can stand by the products, there's good uh, service uh, to basically service the clients and to service the, uh, the products. That's amazing. You gotta have a balance sheet, you gotta have a brand, uh, and then it's up to you. Who are you? you know, are you a trustworthy person? Do you come off you know, credible? Do you have credentials? Do you have licenses? Do you have degrees? Um, and are you uh, likable? Do they like you? Because people really only want to work with people they like at the end of the day. Are you sincere? Do you care? Okay. That's pretty much across the board. And if you could fill out these forms too, this is for the finance club. I'm going to talk a little bit. How much time do I got? How much? Okay. I'm going to talk about the finance club. And I'm going to talk about the investment group. And I'm going to talk about the CFA challenge. Okay. Um, so the, the Finance Club, write this down. We are going to have a event on Wednesday, October 9th at 5 o'clock in the Soda Center. Okay. Um, it's going to be an economic and real estate forecast. Um, I got Jack Rasmus, who's the top economist here in the Zeta. Uh, He's written prolifically on monetary policy and central banking on the world. And he's like one of the top people that I know of um, in, the, in that field. Uh, I also got Robert Sammons, who's the director of research for Cushman Wakefield. Um, he's one of the top real estate economists. You know, if you look at these people's background, they all have master's degrees, undergrads in econ finance, all that stuff. Um, it's at 5 o'clock, and it'll go to 7.30. Um, and if you go to what? Eventbrite, you can... Uh, you can just go on and you can register there too. We're going to hand out flyers and stuff. So I'd help you. Uh, and when I do hand out the flyers, I would appreciate it if you would uh, distribute it um, in your classes to try to drive some traffic. If you know of anybody, your dad, your mom, your uncle, your older sister um, that want to sponsor us and pay for the food because I basically uh, uh, I don't have a food budget for this, so we may be eating you know, Oreo cookies and milk and stuff like that. But we'd like to have something a little bit better. I like those little quiche things, right? We might just have buckets of that quiche stuff. Um, and then I have also have Colin Yashiki, who is the uh, also the uh, director of research and analytics at, at Tom, uh, Cushman Wakefield. He's the top person. They're both out of San Francisco office. Um, I also have Nicole O'Keefe, 
she's an up-and-coming real estate analyst at uh, Kidder Matthews. She actually got her degree here in kinesiology and then went into research. She'll probably be a re research director of one of the top shops, you know, within the next, you know, three to five years. And then I got Heather Belfour, who is the uh, research manager for Jones Lang LaSalle um, in, out of Silicon Valley. Now, those three companies, um, Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, Cushman and Wakefield, and C.B. Richard Ellis, are the top global real estate full service organizations in the world, okay, in the world. So a huge opportunity in marketing and finance and mortgage finance, equity finance, um, uh, investment brokerage, leasing, portfolio management, asset management, property management, um, research. Um, you know, I went and ran uh, a couple research departments for, actually I went, ran four research departments two for uh, large uh, brokerage firms, real estate brokerage firms, um, and also one for an investment management company, and actually, oh, two, I ran the research department for two um, pension fund advisors, okay? So all the stuff that you're learning each time, right? Um, it's just the, the question is, do you, uh, do you recognize it, okay? Uh, so how are we doing? I think I handed out almost everything, except for the, um, we got to do assignments. So we need to break up into teams of three, okay? Can you do that really quickly? Break up into teams of three? Uh, now. So I think there's six teams here. I think we'll be able to do seven teams, okay? Um, so do you guys have your team? Okay, you're one. Number one, team one. Sweet. Okay, so you're going to do chapter one. All right. There's three in the team. Okay, you're three. Okay. And then what team are you? Okay, hold on. So how do you get in the team? Okay, you got to get out there and talk. Do you have a team member? Okay, you guys got to like, uh, you guys got to be proactive about this stuff. I'm not going to, you know, babysit. Dude, when are you guys going to be on our team? You guys Perfect. Your team too. So you're going to do chapter two. Oh, really? Well, I mean, it's got to be teams of three. Okay. Um, do you have team of three? Yeah. Okay. So you're ch uh, team three, chapter three. Okay. Okay. Uh, you're team four, chapter four. Okay. You guys got a team? Team five, chapter five. You're already signing one. Yeah. Two. Okay. There's somebody over there who's not proactively looking for a team. So, um, but we may just leave them over there. Um, so do you have a team? Oh, I'm not going to say. I think I need to take finance first. Uh, no, you don't have to. Are you sure? Yeah. You can, you can, you can take this class. I've had, I've had, I had a sophomore last year oh. who took this class. If you take this class, and you go on and do your other classes, all the other classes will be easy. easier. Easier? Yeah, okay. a lot easier. Okay. And we'll help you. Just don't throw anything away. <laughs> no, we'll help you. Okay. okay. So don't worry about it. Do you have a team? Okay, good job. Okay, you're over there. Thank you. Huh? Is she with us? No, no, no. These ladies are together. Okay? Uh, so you're, you're team six. Okay. And then you're, do you have a team? How many do you have in your team? We got three. We got three. Oh, okay. She's with I'm with them. She's with us. Okay. So who's team one? Right. Right. Team two? Got it. Team three? Got it. Team four? Got it. Team five? Got it. Team six? Perfect. <laughs> and then do you guys still look at Team seven? Yeah. And then you'll take the chip. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, you'll do each team will be Team one, chapter one, team two, chapter two. And what we'll do is on Fridays, we'll do presentations. On Wednesdays, we'll do problems, okay? On Mondays, I'll do lectures. So I lecture on Monday, we come in and do problems on the board. On Wednesdays, we do presentations on Fridays, okay? And it's just boom, 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 boom. So would you yeah. like us to be ready to present by this Friday? Um, it's up to you. 
if you want to go ahead. So I think by this Friday, it's what, chapters one through three? Mm -hmm. uh, the chapters are already posted. Can you unhide your Moodle yeah. site, please? Yeah. 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 I'll do that mm -hmm. right when I get back. Cool. Um, I haven't updated everything, but everything's pretty much there. Mm -hmm. So all the PowerPoints, the solutions mm -hmm. to the homeworks are up there. Um, the, the quiz is take is basically take home. It basically follows the book. So if you read through the book, you can fill it out. You guys can work together and then study the uh, study the exam. But I'm not going to test you on it. It's just to move through the exam. The course is going to be taught on two levels. You'll have the academic level, which will be the book stuff, and then we're going to do application. Okay. Uh, and I'll teach you uh, basically everything I know okay, in regards to this stuff. Uh, how much time do I have? Ten. Ten minutes? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else? Um, you're going to need to bring me a... Uh, this is the call that you're going to do next, uh, next week. Okay, next Wednesday. Right? Next Wednesday? Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Yeah, just come in. Put the solutions up on the board and walk us through. You don't even have to put the problem up. Okay. Just put the solution and then sign in date. Okay. So that you're going to you're going to submit these um, with your homework. Okay. Sign in date. So that'll give you practice and work through some of the problems. You have. get stuck on how to solve the problem because I'm giving you the solution. So you're learning how to, um, to solve the problem. Um, don't forget, I'm going to need your, how many people have resumes? How many people have resumes? Raise your hand. How many people have resumes that have gone through Mary Beth? That have gone through Mary Beth? Up on the uh, second floor of Galilee. Okay. You guys got to give me, if you don't, you need to give me your resumes as soon as possible. So I can help you. Anybody looking for an internship for next summer? Okay, got it. Uh, Cushman Wakefield, uh, go up to Handshake. Handshake? Okay, do you know what it is? Yeah, it's a website. Go up to Handshake and you can have a resume first and sign down that way. First before you uh, uh, before you post and start working. And then we'll coach you too. Okay, you too? Do you have a resume? Awesome. Just have me take a look at it. Give you some, uh, give you some suggestions on how to get done. Okay? Anybody looking for internships now for this uh, semester? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. And would you do real estate? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, you need to talk to me. Anybody else looking for an internship? Uh, make sure you get me your resumes. Anybody looking for... Um, to do a internship or independent study with me. Anybody interested in working with me? Okay. Anybody else? Actually, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so you can work with me on some projects or some research. Do you need credit, like an independent study or an internship credit? No. Okay. So make sure you uh, you talk to me so that we can uh, uh, set out some goals and objectives and. You know, that way you can put it on your resume and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, what else am I missing? Uh, October 9th, 9th event. Okay, let's talk about the um, let's talk about the finance club. Everybody needs to fill out those forms and get it back to me, or actually give it to Elizabeth. Um, and what she'll do is she'll put your um, email in the uh, uh, in our distribution list. Okay. Um, are we taking? Uh, Keen, are we taking uh, resumes now um, for people who would like to um, be in the investment group? Yep. Okay. So um, can they give you the resume? Yep. That's fine. Should the resume be uh, yeah. gone through with? Um, no, that's fine. Just send me a okay. And then don't they have to write like a, uh, a one page or something? Um, uh, why yeah. they want to be in the investment group? I'll just, just meet with them and talk to them. Is that ever going to be your problems? Yeah. Okay, so the investment group. Uh, why don't you, how much time do I have left? Um, seven. seven more time. Okay, uh, seven minutes. Tell, give me a two minute on the investment group. What's your goals and objectives and what are you trying to do? Yeah, and so why would you join? 
The investment group, just the background, we're a student-run fund at a school that manages about $150,000 uh, real money. And so traditionally students come in, you do research, you break them into teams, you build industry experience and knowledge and expertise, and then uh, you send those pitches up to the exec team, and then we gloss in those trades, we go on which trades are probably the best, and then, yeah, you know, money for the portfolio. Um, so it's a great resume booster, it's great for experience, you learn a lot. And yeah, that's, you know, if you're interested in investing, you're interested in learning more, or you want to boost yourself to that next stage, then yeah, go ahead and click. Okay. Yeah. Elizabeth, why don't you tell us about the finance? Yeah. Okay. So why would you join the finance? Um, we're great, we want you to get an internship. Um, we offer great events that you can network with um, great people that you can network with. <laughs> we meet on Wednesday. Um, but there will be an upcoming day as to when to meet, so check your emails. Thank you. Uh, we also, our goal and objective for the uh, finance club is to get you internships and jobs. That's it. Okay. So the, uh, the event on uh, October 9th, um, I got uh, hiring managers coming. I got professionals from the industry coming. So you're going to be meeting with professionals, which your elevator pitch. I'm looking for an internship or a job in the real estate industry or finance industry. You do that, you know, 50 times, you probably get the two or three. Yeah. So here's the movies. Inside job, big short. Are we going to watch an in class or a? Uh, probably not. Probably do it on your own. Are the meetings up? Also, what we'll do on Thursday is I'm going to show you after I turn on the, uh, the site. There's going to be a list of Excel spreadsheets that you're going to be working with in your teams. Okay, um, and we'll do that. I'll show you what they look like, and I'll walk you through them. Um, and then what we'll do is that'll be your first project that you'll be working on. So you may want to think about what 25 stocks. I mean, you were to build a portfolio with 25 stocks, would you put in a portfolio? Uh, how much of the portfolio would be large cap, mid cap, small cap stocks? And again, you can work with some of the people if you don't understand the terminology. And then what percentage of the uh, portfolio is by sector? Uh, what's the percentage by sector and what companies will make up that sector within the portfolio? Is it going to be a opportunistic portfolio where you're chasing yield? Or are you looking for you know, a yield that will beat the benchmark, such as the S&P 500, but diversified across different sectors? Is it, is it going to be a defensive? Portfolio, or are you looking for growth in income with you know 25 percent in large cap, 25 percent in small cap, and 25 percent in mid cap type stocks? So start thinking about what type of portfolio, what type of client, what type of customer that you would be marketing this to. Okay, and you can go up and you can look at mutual funds, and you can go look at, at exchange traded funds and look at the, those strategies that will give you an idea of the breakdown by sector, historical returns, and then uh, give you an idea of the companies that make up those, those portfolios. How much time do you have? Uh, lastly, what we're going to do is, uh, uh, Chikino is now the president of the finance group. Uh, the dean has basically advised us um, to build a project in class to help him uh, write his uh, bylaws and his portfolio strategy. So this is going to be an application class, not only the portfolio stuff, so you may want to think about that. Um, and then we'll do individual stock. We'll make, I'll make you do one individual stock intrinsic valuations. You've already done these in my other class. So you can pick a stock that you want to do. I don't want everybody to do Apple. Um, but then what I'll do is I'll walk you through how to do this intrinsic valuation presentation. Um, and then you'll walk away with this, too, in the class. So you'll have the memos, you'll have this, you'll have the individual portfolio projects, and then you'll have the uh, portfolio trading system at the end as the walk away. Do not give away the portfolio trading system to anybody unless you have a signed employment contract with the person, okay? Because that thing is worth millions of dollars, literally millions of dollars. The portfolios that we back tested have all beat the benchmark by at least two to four hundred basis points in alpha. Okay? So they've done a really good job of that. 
The moving average trading system has generated $100,000 a year per year over the last three years. So that's another 10%. So between the two, the portfolios can generate uh, roughly 20% per year return based on the rule of 72. How many years does it take to double your money if your portfolio is increasing 20% per year? So it's 72 divided by two. What is it? 36, so 3.6, 3.6 years. Okay. If, uh, if I get 40%, get 40% rate of return, how long does it take me to double my money? Yeah, a year and a half. Okay, so 40%, a year and a half. Um, 20%, 3.5 years. 10%, 7.2 years. That's all we care about. Okay. So depending on the client, the risk averse, looking for diversification but a decent return, I can give them an 8 to 10 percent rate of return, they're going to double their money in uh, less than 10 years. They'll take it. But more risky investors are going to want us to trade the systems, they want trading systems, they want active portfolio strategies, they're going to want at least 20 20 percent return, so they're going to want to double their money in 3.5 years. And some people are going for trading, options trading, writing, buying, options contracts, going long, buying on margin, going short stocks, and they want at least 40% to maybe 80% rate of return. So they want to double their money, in some cases, not only less than two years, but less than a year. We haven't really taken that, this class at that level yet, but we get pretty close. Okay. So the course basically is a, is a concentration, a master's in, master's in finance crammed into a semester. And if you took 123 in conjunction with this, you walk away in two semesters with basically two years of fi financial finance applications. Okay. Now, Professor Souza, they're undergraduate students. They're not graduate students. Psst. Undergrads are just as good as grad students. Just as motivated. They do just as good. So why not teach the same level? That's what they do at MIT, and Harvard, and Wharton and NYU and Columbia. They teach the undergrads and the graduates. There's no difference. Just one group decided to go back and get a master's degree. Okay?